following the news lately, and in particular if you've been reading through the sports section, then you'll already know that concussions and traumatic brain injuries are a rather big deal. And in light of some of the very high profile uh, cases of concussion and traumatic brain injury in athletes, as well as the emerging controversy in the NFL and other sports leagues about the long term effects of these concussions, it may seem as though we're living, I guess, in the age of concussions. This, of course, isn't true. Concussions have always been a problem. But as our methods of diagnosis become more sophisticated, and as our in-depth study of the phenomenon becomes increasingly precise, we really are starting to get a sense of the true scale of the problem, and the implications thereof are starting to be difficult to ignore. With all that being said, it seems worthwhile, I think, to spend some time getting familiar with the science of concussions and traumatic brain injuries so that we can at least begin to make sense of this once silent epidemic. We are not our shoulders, we're, we're not our kidneys for that matter, or our livers, or our hearts, but in contrast, we are our brains. And so depending on the extent to which you would describe yourself as a materialist, that is to say, somebody who believes that the material world of neurons and synapses is sufficient by itself to explain all aspects of human consciousness, we are either entirely our brains, or at least a very large fraction our brains. But even if you were a full-blown dualist, you certainly wouldn't deny that the brain is important. Anyhow, if we are our brains, it seems to follow that we should take brain injuries especially seriously and treat them in a manner that is distinct from how we would treat, say, shoulder injuries. If you've ever held a real brain, or if you've seen one in a museum or a biology lab even, then you'd be forgiven for believing that the brain is a rather firm and resilient organ. Brains that are prepared for museums or as laboratory specimens are, are put through a process called fixation. And this process is essential. It serves to preserve the brain. It makes it easier to slice into thin sections because it firms the brain up. But a fresh brain, in contrast to the, to the fixed preserved brain that you might be thinking of or that we're looking at here, a fresh brain is extremely soft and extremely squishy. It's, it's rather more like a very loose gelatin dessert than anything else. A fresh brain cannot support its own weight, and if you happen to have one, and if you were to leave it on your desk, uh, you'd find that it would begin to collapse into itself. Now, this is true of all brains, of course, but it's especially true of very large and heavy brains, and we humans have very large and heavy brains. I suppose, in an ideal scenario, we'd be able to encase our brains in stainless steel safes. Maybe we could surround them with pillows and foam padding. Even more ideally, I suppose, we wouldn't even carry our brains around with us. It's too much of a risk. We could keep them locked away in some kind of remote facility and pilot our bodies as though they're drones. Of course, that's unfortunately still within the realm of science fiction. The reality is that we do keep our brains in our skulls, and our skulls most assuredly are not safes. Well, how is our brain protected? We can dig into a bit of anatomy to find the answer. So here is a cross section of a human head, and inside we've got a very simplified diagram of the brain. You'll see, by the way, that I prefer to draw brains that look a bit more like boxing gloves than actual brains, and really this is just because I'm not very good at drawing. And uh, honestly, it's also because I'm a bit lazy. But you can use your imagination and add the gyri and the sulci and all of the other bits and pieces of anatomy that are hopefully well known to you at this point. We have some obvious protective measures in the skin of the scalp and of course the skull itself, but there's more to it than that. So let's look at those layers a bit more closely. Zooming in, we have the cerebral cortex. Now this is the outermost layer of the brain. Inconveniently enough, I guess, it's also the site of our highest and most treasured functions. You know, we see with our cortex, we feel with our cortex, and to a large extent we also think with our cortex. And it's true, of course, that we are our brains, but to be even more precise about it, I would say that we probably are our cortices, at least in large part. Anyhow, there are uh, three layers of membranes that surround the external surface of the brain, and these membranes are collectively known as the meninges. And so if we start from the cortex 
and work outwards, the first layer that you'll see is called the pia matter. And then you see the arachnoid, and then finally the dura matter. The name dura matter, uh, by the way, comes from Latin. It means tough mother. Yes, and pia matter means tender mother. So if we look at these layers more closely, say if we were to use the powers of this magical 3D cube, we'll see that they each serve a very important purpose. The pia matter clings quite tightly to the external surface of the brain, and actually it interacts with glial cells near the outside of the brain. It, it has a way of forming this interface called the pia glial membrane. You might liken this to shrink wrap, perhaps around the brain, or, or maybe, you know, when you buy a new phone, the screen comes covered in that plasticky stuff. Now moving outward, you'll find a small empty space. This empty space is crisscrossed by thin thread-like fibers called trabeculae. This is called the subarachnoid space, and it's called that because it's an open-ish space directly below the arachnoid. And this space is filled with cerebrospinal fluid. It's that, that briny, salty fluid that your brain floats around in. The space is also crisscrossed with blood vessels that supply the meninges with blood and also help drain blood away from the brain. And then further out from that you have the dura matter again. And this is the thickest and toughest of all the meninges. And it's also the layer that sort of directly interfaces with the skull. And you might have wondered why arachnoid was given its name. The name arachnoid, of course, uh, sounds like arachnid, and we all know that that means spider. And it turns out that to early anatomists, the trabeculae crisscrossing the empty space, the subarachnoid space, had the appearance of a spider web. And, and so when you put all of this together, it's a few millimeters thick at best, with another few millimeters of skull and skin on the outside. And that's really all you have to protect you against most of the everyday bumps and bruises. And it does a fairly good job, after all. You can move your head about from place to place and go about your daily business and even roughhouse a little bit, and nothing that bad really happens. It's very well suited to the everyday things that a brain can encounter. But when you're subject to forces that are over and above the everyday level, things that are more than your brain is prepared to handle, things can get a little rough. And so we can sketch out a sort of idealized head injury and use this to get a more quantitative sense of the types of forces that our brains experience. Now for the purposes of this demonstration, we can take a trip to a place I call Magic Physics Land. And here in this world, we don't have to worry about friction, and we can put our experimental test subject here and move him along in a straight line on a frictionless skateboard. And when his head makes contact with this obstacle, it makes perfect contact and the obstacle doesn't move or react in any kind of way. I know this sounds a bit fishy, but you know, for a demonstration like this, I think it's better to admit your limitations and make the best use of your findings in spite of them. And, of course, in magic physics land, the clouds are happy and the sun will wear sunglasses. So to address the forces that your brain encounters, we can resort to some very simple, you know, physics 101, high school physics equations. We're curious, at least in this world, mostly with the amount of g-force that your, your head would experience when you strike it against an object. You know, we might actually do better to use units other than g-force, but as far as back-of-the-envelope calculations here, g-force at least puts everything in units that we can easily appreciate. It's not even really a measure of force, it's a measure of acceleration. But again, we're, we're using this on the back of the envelope, so to speak. So we'll take this equation that I've given you, and we'll take the empty variables and we'll populate them with values that you could plausibly get from real football. And I, I choose football only for the sake of tying into this ongoing controversy with, with the NFL. I could very easily pick values from hockey or from NASCAR or from bicycling. And, and, and it all, it all would, would work out. Real football, of course, is, is a much more complicated situation than what I'm describing. Football players don't ride around on frictionless skateboards and crash into each other. But still, we're looking for an illustration, not a definitive figure. Really, I wasn't even sure of the best way to calculate all this, but I do know the time it takes a player to sprint 40 yards, uh, they call this the 40-yard dash, is fairly important and well-documented for many, many players. So I decided to use that as a figure in this equation. And so if a player can cover 40 yards in 4.3 seconds, then his average speed is around 8.5 meters per second. 
you'll see that I converted it to metric. And so now we know his average velocity, we need to know his stopping distance when he hits an obstacle, we need to know how much distance he covers when he comes in contact with whatever he hits. Here I've resorted to just making up a number, I decided to say 15 centimeters. I'm basing this on the idea that he's hitting another player of nearly the same mass, moving in basically the opposite direction at top speed. And so you could imagine it takes about 15 centimeters for them to slow down and stop. A worst case scenario to be sure, but probably one that still happens quite routinely. Now in the formula, V is the final velocity, which will be zero because the players are coming to a stop. We can just remove it from the equation entirely. S is the distance over which this deceleration occurs, and again, we'll put the 15 centimeters in there. Well, we'll convert it to meters first, then put it in. G is the free fall acceleration rate on Earth, and that's 9.8 meters per second squared. Anyhow, we plug all of this in, and we end up with an acceleration equal to 24.57 G. Now, we could go on and use F equals MA to find force, but since adult brains are usually have about the same mass, uh, it wouldn't necessarily add a lot to our understanding to plug that value in. All we're really saying here is that whatever your body's mass happens to be, under the conditions I described, it would experience a deceleration that's over 24 times greater than what would be naturally provided by the Earth's gravitational field. Earth, by the way, has a mass of about 5.97 times 10 to the 24 kilograms, and the gravitational field that that mass provides gives us a free fall acceleration of about 1 g. And I think it's neat to consider the fact that you, in all of your fleshy humanness, maybe you weigh 70 kilograms or something like that, you can easily resist the gravitational force of the entire planet with just the muscles in your body. Even babies quickly grow to be able to support themselves against the gravitational pull of the Earth. And, and I think it goes to show just how incredibly weak gravity is, at least within the realm of ordinary planets. When you get up to black holes, it becomes the strongest force you can imagine. Okay, I'm getting off track. Back to concussions. So what happens to your brain when you experience sudden acceleration or deceleration? Well, the laws of physics are universal, so maybe we can study the situation in a model system. And I like to use cars because we ride around in them all the time, and, and so I think they make a bit of an interesting model. And so if you imagine yourself in a car traveling down the highway, and then imagine that you suddenly strike an immovable obstacle, you'll find that the car has to decelerate from its initial velocity all the way down to a complete stop in only about the distance provided by the crumple zones. The wall isn't moving anywhere, so it's only by crumpling up that the car can dissipate all of that energy. And so you can actually use the formula I gave you before uh, to estimate these forces, but I should warn you uh, to prepare for horror at the results. You know, it's the tendency of objects to stay in motion, but ultimately you have to decelerate the same as the car, and inevitably that means that you have to come in contact with an opposing force. And it's usually provided by your seatbelt, or your dashboard, or the windscreen, uh, or in the worst case scenario, the wall itself. And so your brain finds itself in an analogous situation. The brain is a bit like a passenger in your skull, if you were to imagine your skull as a car. The brain can float around and it's free to move about within certain limits, but ultimately it's subject to the forces that impinge upon the skull. And if you're moving along at a certain velocity and you suddenly stop, the brain, having been moving at that very same velocity up till that point, must also come to a stop in a fairly short period of time. And so just like as a passenger hits the dashboard, or the windscreen, or whatever else, the brain has to come to a stop, usually by hitting the skull. Its movement is certainly slowed and buffered somewhat by the cerebrospinal fluid, but still, as I said before, those are really better suited to protecting your brain from minor bumps, not the massive trauma of, of a rapid deceleration. And so if you're moving forward and suddenly stop, the brain will continue onward until it strikes the front of your skull. This moment of it striking the front of your skull is called the coup. A and unfortunately the story doesn't end there. You see, the brain is somewhat elastic, and for that matter, so is your neck. 
And so there's almost always a recoil that takes place. The brain will bounce backwards. And as it does, the opposite side of the brain comes in contact with the opposite side of the skull. And so this second injury is called the contra-coup because it occurs opposite to the coup, the first injury. And so what you have is something called a coup contra coup injury, and it's very typical of brain injuries. You might hit your head in one place, but you could expect to encounter an injury in two separate places, usually on opposite sides. Now, as I mentioned, most brains are of a relatively similar mass, about 1.4 kilograms. And so the greatest determinant of the force that they experience is the deceleration to which they are subject. The more rapid the deceleration, the greater the difference between the initial and final speed, the worse the injury. And the most common type of injury, at least in terms of prevalence, results from low to medium speed collisions. And we call this a mild traumatic brain injury, or MTBI. And actually, MTBIs and concussions are one and the same. The terms are largely interchangeable, and so more often than not, I'll say concussion. The two are, are, are basically the same thing. Now, concussions don't have a universal set of symptoms. Every injury is unique, and every injury affects slightly different parts of the brain, and occurs under slightly unique situations. And so accordingly, the symptoms of concussion can vary from person to person. But there are some nearly universal symptoms, things that you'll see in most cases of, of traumatic brain injury. You can get headaches, for example, that are occurring immediately after the injury, or perhaps with a delayed onset. Dizziness is very common, and again, it can happen either in the acute time frame, right after the injury, or, or beyond. Fatigue, or tiredness, is, is very commonly reported. And this one usually comes in during the aftermath of the injury, and can hang around for a disturbingly long period of time, depending on the nature and severity of the injury. Light sensitivity, or photophobia as it's often called, can occur as well. You might have memory problems, and they may be chronic, but more often they are localized in the time immediately surrounding the injury. And so it's often the case that people who sustain a head injury can't remember the circumstances that led up to that injury. We call that retrograde amnesia. And they also have trouble remembering events immediately after the injury, and we call that anterograde amnesia with respect to the time of injury. And this is especially bad with individuals who lose consciousness because, of course, they really can't form memories while they're unconscious. Another, more subtle issue that can set in after an injury is reduced attention. This can also last a disturbingly long time. You can also get emotional changes. These also usually kick in a little while after the injury. And so these are rarely improvements in emotion. Much more often they're things like depression or short-temperedness or irritability. People who have suffered a brain injury often report difficulty in concentration, or something that they might describe as a brain fog that sets in after the injury. And this brain fog, this difficulty with concentration, these problems with memory, even these uh, emotional problems, well, they all conspire to make it very difficult to return to work, or to return to school, or, or to return to everyday life if you've happened to suffer these alongside your head injury. Nausea and blurred vision are also common more in the immediate aftermath of the injury. And you can also get reduced attention. Oh wait, I already said that. <laughs> now it's been suggested that MTBIs are a silent epidemic. And again, if you follow the news, then it might seem to you as though there's a sudden epidemic of brain injuries in the world. Athletes seem to be getting injured on a routine basis, and we seem to be following their recovers with a high level of sustained attention. And so by these standards, concussions and MTBIs are hardly a silent epidemic. More accurately, they're on the mind of almost everybody. But the thing is, the fact that concussions seem like such a new and sudden problem actually perfectly supports the argument that they were previously a silent epidemic. After all, sports really haven't changed very much over the decades, and there really hasn't been any major advances in safety gear or even in medical treatment of brain injuries in that time. And so the rate of concussions, in other words, likely hasn't changed very much. We're witnessing, therefore, I think, an increase in awareness, not necessarily an increase in the prevalence or the rate of concussions. Accordingly, 
we're also seeing people pay more attention to marginal cases. You know, back in the day, a minor bump to the head might have simply been ignored. But now we're a lot more aware of, of the problems they can cause, and so we're paying a lot more attention to even minor injuries that we would have ordinarily just shrugged off. And this newfound attention, again, makes it seem as though the rate of injury is increasing. Uh, more likely it's just the rate of detected injury. And so something like six in a thousand people will suffer a traumatic brain injury every year in the United States. And of those, about 88% of them are mild traumatic brain injuries, or MTBIs. And so in the United States, there's something like 1.6 to 3.8 million of them per year. But we can never really be sure of the exact figure because it relies on people being diligent about reporting it and admitting that they are really suffering from a brain injury. Now everyone has a brain, and so everyone is somewhat at risk of one of these injuries. But obviously some activities are more risky than others. And so the question becomes, who takes these risks? Well, risk takers are usually young, and yes, they're more often males. And so the highest risk of concussion is seen among young males. Older males, being males, are also at an elevated risk. Women are not free of risk, it's just that their overall rate of participation in these kind of risky, violent activities is somewhat lower. So at this point we should turn inward and have a look at how concussions affect the brain at a microscopic level. Recall, as we go into this, that the typical brain injury involves damage at both the point of impact, but also at the end opposite to that point. Linear acceleration, as we're showing here, naturally has its hazards. So let's look at the cerebral cortex as a, as a sort of case study for the effects of these forces. Now, the gray matter consists of cell bodies, and we'll start by drawing the pyramidal cells of the cortex, and they're named that because their cell bodies look a little bit like pyramids when you visualize them by the Golgi-Cox method. Then you have the stellate cells and the fusiform cells and various other types of cells that populate the cortex. Pyramidal cells are the ones that contribute most of the axons to the white matter below. But the white matter also contains axons that are incoming from the thalamus and other places. And so what you end up with then is something that looks a little bit like a sandwich. There's different layers of material stacked one on top of the other. If you've ever picked up a sandwich and had the contents slip out from between the bread slices, you may be able to guess where I'm going with this. The cerebrum, when it's subject to sufficient acceleration or deceleration experiences a phenomenon very similar to that sandwich. In this case, the gray matter, being of a different density, has the tendency to sort of slide across the white matter. It's the action of shearing forces, and so to demonstrate this I'll fashion a crude animated illustration. You see, imagine a force pointed in this direction. If it's sufficiently powerful, you'll see a tendency for the gray matter to continue sliding even as the white matter comes to a stop. And at the boundary of, between these two layers, of course, you have axons. And these axons now are subject to injury as a consequence of all this sliding and shearing and stretching. Now, since the shearing and stretching of axons is so problematic, it turns out that the worst kind of force that a brain can receive is actually rotational. Rotational forces occur fairly often in head injuries. Boxers, I'm told, are trained to aim for the opponent's jaw. Now, aside from the fact that it really hurts to get hit in the jaw, this location happens to offer the most leverage for imposing rotational forces on the head. And rotational forces, likely through their ability to damage axons like this in the cerebrum, are the most likely to lead to a loss of consciousness, a knockout, in other words. And since this injury tends to be widespread across the cortex when it occurs, we have a name for it called diffuse axonal injury. And again, this injury could be as simple as stretching, or it could be as extreme as tearing. Now, axons can tolerate a fair bit of punishment, but only really when they're stretched along their axis. You know, our limbs, our arms and legs have axons running their length. We need them in order to connect our skin and muscles to our spinal cord. And of course, these axons will stretch during the normal operation of these limbs, but they really only stretch along their length. They have very limited tolerance to shearing and to stretching against their axis. Tearing of the axon, of course, is the most severe outcome. And when an axon is torn, you have a, an injury called a primary axotomy. 
but stretch can be very bad too. And this is especially true in the brain, where axons aren't built to tolerate very much movement. So to see what goes on at the microscopic level, let's look at an axon up close. Now the tubular shape of the axon, and in fact the shape of the neuron in general, is supported by a structure called the cytoskeleton. Now the cytoskeleton, as the name suggests, it has a structure that's analogous to a skeleton for the cell. It actually consists of long strands of proteins called microtubules. Now in the axon, these microtubules run parallel down the length of the axon, forming bundles that sort of support its shape. And in addition to this structural role, the cytoskeleton is also very important in providing a conduit for the transport of goods and services down the length of the axon. Neurotransmitters, enzymes, structural proteins, nutrients, neurotransmitter precursors, they're all shuttled up and down the length of the axon by special motor proteins. And these motor proteins are able to move through interactions with the microtubules. The synapse, after all, at the end of the axon, is filled with all sorts of specialized proteins that allow it to do what it does, that allow it to synthesize neurotransmitters and receive signals and move ions about and all that other stuff. And for the most part, it can't synthesize those proteins on site. They have to be imported from machinery that's located in the cell body. The phenomenon, by the way, is called transport. And so if an axon is stretched or sheared, or, or worst case, even torn, these microtubules can break at various points. When they snap, transport along their length becomes impossible. Now, for whatever reason, neurons are not generally clever enough to fully make sense of this. They can't exactly tell if their transport systems have broken down, and so they don't stop attempting to transport while the axon repairs itself. And so what you end up with after time goes by is a sort of a backlog or a traffic jam of products that have been stuck in transit, and they become clumped up into structures called varicosities. These varicosities are usually concentrated around the site of injury, and so you see under the microscope something that looks a bit like a grotesque string of pearls. Now for a musical interlude while I break some spaghetti. And you can pretend that these spaghettis are your microtubules. As if it weren't bad enough that axonal transport is interrupted, a fair bit of damage actually results not from the injury itself, but from the events that immediately follow the injury in the short term. And we call these phenomena secondary injuries. And so one of the earliest effects that you'll see in neurons is a massive efflux of potassium. Efflux, by the way, means that the potassium is leaving the cell. It's going outside the cell. Now, under ordinary conditions, Neurons do prefer their internal potassium levels to be kept nice and high. Sodium, by contrast, is kept at relatively higher levels outside the cell, so that inside of a neuron, potassium is high and sodium is low, and then outside the neuron, sodium is high and potassium is low. Maintaining this state of affairs is part of what allows neurons to maintain their resting potential. And so it's very, very important for neural signaling. Now, when an axon is stretched, there are potassium channels that open up and allow potassium to slip through the membrane. And of course, since potassium levels are normally much higher inside the cell than they're outside, when you give them an open door, the tendency is that they will rush out and reach an equilibrium on either side of the membrane. So if you think back to the neurophysiology lecture at the beginning of class, you might recall that I hinted the fact that the neuron's resting potential is maintained by a combination of active and passive forces. Now it's time to describe one of those active mechanisms, and we'll be able to see the role it plays in this whole concussion story. You see, neurons, and for that matter, just about every other cell in your body, has membranes that are dotted with structures known as sodium-potassium pumps. So if we were to view one of these pumps from the side and look at it in cartoon form, we'd see this. Now from this point of view, we can divide the world into in and out. That is, inside the cell and outside the cell. And the two halves of the world are separated by the cell's membrane, a phospholipid bilayer. 
And since the cell membrane is impermeable to ions, that is to say, ions can't naturally get across the membrane, it's a barrier to them, they have to be admitted selectively by the actions of proteins buried in that membrane. And these could either be ion channels that are open all the time, or ligand-gated ion channels that are activated by neurotransmitters, or voltage-gated ion channels, or they could be pumps, like this thing here. The sodium-potassium pump keeps that optimal ionic balance of high potassium inside and high sodium outside. Here's how it works. You know, being a cycle, it is a bit difficult to say how it works and decide on a spot to begin, because cycles go in loops and you could start anywhere and be equally as valid. But we'll start here. Every turn of the pump begins with three sodium ions binding to special pockets on the intracellular surface of the pump's protein. Once these sodium ions bind, the protein reacts and it undergoes what's called a conformational change. It actually changes shape. And as it does this, the new shape allows for the binding of ATP and the transfer of a high-energy phosphate to the pump. And what you end up with as a result is ADP. So this phosphorylation event induces yet another conformational change. And this time, the protein changes shape to sort of prolapse a little bit. And now it's able to spew the sodium ions into the extracellular space. This new conformation, you see, doesn't bind very strongly with sodium. So once the sodium is, is moved to the outside, it's quite easily released and let go. Actually now, in this new shape, it's much more receptive to potassium ions. And so what happens then is two of these will eventually bind with the protein. And once they do, it undergoes yet another change in shape. And this time, the protein draws the ions inward and releases them toward the intracellular side. And at the same time, its, its phosphate is released and the protein returns to its kind of default configuration and it's ready to accept more sodium ions. In the end, therefore, you end up with two sodium ions that have been moved to the outside of the cell and two potassium ions that have been moved to the inside of the cell and the breakdown of one molecule of ATP into ADP and a spare phosphate. And this process is repeated many, many times a second by countless numbers of pumps all over the place in the cell. And so what the collective action of these yields is a high intracellular potassium content and a high extracellular sodium content. But notice that each turn of this pump requires the cell to spend a molecule of ATP. In fact, for this reason, the pump is sometimes called a sodium-potassium ATPase, because it breaks down a molecule of ATP in its operation. This has to be because the pump is working against the concentration gradients of the ions, and for that matter, against their voltage gradients. It's basically pushing them uphill, and so the cell has to spend energy to do this. The ions don't naturally want to do this. They have to be forced by the use of energy. And so when the delicate balance of ions is upset by injury, suddenly these pumps are obligated to work overtime in order to re-establish the cell's usual equilibrium. Overtime work requires massive quantities of energy, and so the cell's metabolism has to work overtime as well in order to keep up with the demand for all that energy. And actually in neurons, the sodium-potassium pump may already be using up to half of the cell's energy. And so it's a very big deal uh, when its demands increase like this. Now the brain's preferred source of energy is glucose, and it begins its journey through metabolism in the cytoplasm. But soon enough, metabolites of glucose are brought into the mitochondria where they enter the Krebs cycle, and each turn of this cycle produces ATP. And the net result of all of these processes, once all of the debts are paid off and all of the bills settle, you end up with 36 molecules of ATP for each molecule of glucose. Now this process, when it works correctly and when it's working at the correct rate, is essential for life and largely harmless. Our bodies do it all the time. But when it goes into overdrive, and when the cell's ability to deal with the waste products is compromised, and both happen to injure neurons, by the way, the situation becomes a great deal more dangerous. You know, you can imagine metabolism as a fire burning within your cells. Uh, maybe you could picture it as a fireplace in your home if you're lucky enough to have one. Your home's fireplace is built to tolerate fires only of a certain size. And so if they burn out of control, 
or if you add too much fuel to the flame, their waste products, that is to say smoke and ash, begin to overwhelm your home's capacity to get rid of them. Your living room becomes flooded with smoke and you have to escape to the outside to survive. And something roughly analogous can happen inside of neurons that are overworked in a similar way. But we're not done yet. There are even more problems that neurons have to face. Glutamate, the brain's primary excitatory neurotransmitter, is the biggest offender in a phenomenon called excitotoxicity. Glutamate is normally synthesized ahead of time and stored in the presynaptic terminals until it's needed. And partly as a result of the ionic balances I mentioned earlier, injured neurons will very often spill their neurotransmitters indiscriminately into synapses. Other neurons that happen to be on the receiving end of those synapses don't really have the insight to realize that it's all a big mistake. And so they exhibit an exaggerated response or an exaggerated version of their usual response to glutamate signaling. And the effect is mediated in part by a type of glutamate receptor called the NMDA receptor. NMDA receptors are normally quiescent, but they can be forced into action by high levels of glutamate. And when they're activated, they open up and they act like calcium channels, allowing calcium ions to rush into the receiving cell. Now, under ordinary conditions, this process is very important for the formation of memory at the synaptic level. But in pathological conditions like this, the results are a great deal more sinister. The influx in calcium, among the many things that it does, tends to force even more potassium out, thus further compounding the problem. The postsynaptic cell, being overexcited by all of this glutamate, can be damaged or even killed in the process. Excitotoxicity, by the way, is also seen in strokes and many other types of brain injuries, so there's a great deal of interest in, in trying to control its effects. Meanwhile, injured neurons and adjacent microglia begin to release cytokines into the surrounding environment, again as a consequence of, of this injury. Interleukin-1 is an example of a cytokine that's released during brain damage. Now it seems that interleukin-1 is actually neuroprotective, at least in the short term. It helps protect the brain against infection and perhaps other consequences of the injury. Other cytokines, for example tumor necrosis factor alpha, or TNF-alpha for short, are not quite as helpful. These ones tend to lead to neuroinflammation and generally make the problem worse. Astrocytes, which are another type of glial cell, they react to the injury by releasing S100B. Now S100B is interesting because it can leak into the bloodstream, and being that it can get into the blood, it may be a useful diagnostic marker of brain injury. You'll be able to test for brain injury with a blood test, which is a great deal less invasive than anything else you could do. Neurons also produce uh, something called amyloid precursor protein, or APP. And this is something that you begin to see accumulating in chronic conditions like Alzheimer's disease. So the brain is flooded by all this stuff, the neurons are stretched and torn, the synapses are crying tears of glutamate. Well, I'm being a bit dramatic, but it is a bad situation, and it's very chaotic at the microscopic level. At the macroscopic level, however, things are rather different. You know, a doctor would really not be able to tell, at least not without careful investigation, whether or not any of these things were happening to you. Brain scans rarely reveal diffuse axonal injury, at least in its mild form. And really, who bothers getting their brain scanned after a minor bump to the head anyway? You'd probably have to wait a year just to get a turn on the machine. And so it may seem to you, and it may seem to those who are observing you, that you're basically fine. A blow to the head may not even knock you out, much less give you the ability to accurately sense what's going on. And so you might feel almost able to get back up and resume whatever it was you're doing to return to play, let's say. And of course, there's a substantial incentive in getting right back up again. You don't want to look like a wimp, you know, and you don't want to confront your own physical weakness, and maybe you just don't want to believe what's going on, or maybe you just don't know what's going on. The thing is, though, we do know that these things happen, and we know that they're real. So I think it's important to do your best to override the desire to be tough, and take a break after you hit your head. Now, if that pep talk wasn't enough to convince you, then let's consider the phenomenon of second impact syndrome, or SIS. SIS occurs when you sustain a brain injury while you're still symptomatic from an earlier one. In other words, a double concussion. And if you happen to suffer from second impact syndrome, you're basically dealing with a 50-50 chance of death. That's right. Getting two brain injuries in a row is so dangerous that it amounts to flipping a coin with your life. And the morbidity rate, or the rate of disability, 
is 100%. You know, if you think back to when Sidney Crosby was recovering from his brain injury, he made very sure to take plenty of time off to make sure that his brain was completely healed before he came back to play. Another injury while his brain was still recovering wouldn't have just been a setback. It could very well have been fatal. You just have to let your brain recover, and there's really nothing that you can do aside from just waiting it out. The only cure in this scenario is time. So MTBIs are bad news, and they can damage your brain, and I hope you know more about how they work now than you did before. But still, at its core, this is not very new information. The NFL is not at the center of all this controversy because it was somehow a big secret that football put you at risk of concussion, or that concussions were bad. No, it's well known that concussions are an occupational hazard in many, many sports. Players willingly take the risk. But what wasn't very well known, at least until recent times, was the long-term effects of multiple small brain injuries. Now, years ago, there was an NFL player named Mike Webster, and they really don't come any tougher than Mike Webster. In fact, his nickname was Iron Mike. He was ludicrously strong by really any standard. He could bench over 400 pounds, keeping in mind, by the way, that most people can't even bench press their own body weight. He could probably deadlift tree stumps out of the ground, and he was said to enjoy slogging through the cold, rainy, grimy sorts of games, and really seemed to just thrive on discomfort. At any rate, there is a 0% chance that Webster was either physically or mentally weak. He seemed to be a glutton for punishment in both capacities. And he left the NFL at age 38, and after he did, he began to decline mentally. And so he developed problems with his memory, problems with his mood, and in the end, he declined to a point where he became completely disabled. He actually died at the, at the age of 50 as a disabled, wandering soul living out of his pickup truck. Now, a pathologist named Bennett Amalu got a hold of Webster's brain after he died and decided to investigate it. And so here's the paper that he and his team published. And in the investigation, they found evidence of neurodegeneration, atrophy, as well as a buildup of things called amyloid beta plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. These were all concentrated in the frontal, parietal, and temporal lobes of the cerebrum. And so if you were to take a coronal slice of the brain, it would look a bit like this. And here in brown is the amyloid beta and the neurofibrillary tangles. Now I'll tell you more about what these things are when we cover dementia later on. But for now it's sufficient to say that you're really only supposed to see these in much older brains that have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's or some other type of dementia. In fact, really the only type of people that they knew of that you see this type of degeneration in in a young age are boxers. And career boxers suffer from a, a well-known phenomenon called dementia pugilistica. You could also call it punch drunk. And it's a neurodegenerative condition, almost certainly as a consequence of being repeatedly punched in the head. But now we know it can happen to more than just boxers. And so the condition is now known as chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE for short. And so they found CTE in Mike Webster's brain. And since then, they've looked at numerous other NFL players who have met with an early death, and they found, more often than you'd ever expect, evidence of CTE in their brains as well. It's even been observed in players that are as young as in their 20s. Suicide, by the way, is sadly a common cause of death in these individuals, likely as a byproduct of a lot of the mood disorders that go along with CTE. And football's a violent game, of course, and head injuries are always a risk. But the NFL would never promote this, would they? It's one of football's fiercest rivalries, the Raiders and the Chiefs, on ABC's Monday Night Football. Oh. So what types of treatments are available for concussions and for CTE? Unfortunately, not many. There are no drugs known that can reverse this kind of brain damage, at least not yet. The only thing you can do is seek medical advice and give your brain plenty of time to heal, and avoid second impact syndrome, whatever you do. And really avoid strenuous mental activity of any sort. The best thing is to really just sit around doing nothing for as long as you can. So I think it's important, given the inadequacy of our preventative measures, and given the absence of really useful treatments, to keep in mind that any high-speed, high-impact activity goes well beyond our body's normal parameters. And so it's just important, I think, to play safe when it comes to this, and take care of yourself as much as you can. And it really doesn't matter how tough you are, 
your brain is still squishy and fragile, and it's still the most important thing that you own. I mean, it is you.